It's an honor to be here. I always consider it an honor to be used by God, to be asked to speak or minister. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful and excited to be here. And if I'm being honest, this is one of my, one of my favorite formats to speak in because it's a very, it's a very relaxed atmosphere. As, as Pastor Jared mentioned earlier, that it's a different kind of service, a closed campus, and uh, not really anyone in, in here. But I do love it. I love it for many reasons. One, I said it's relaxed. And two, I know that a lot of our saints are traveling. A lot of people go on vacation from around here and... Uh, I know that they're taking this message with them, so I feel like I'm seeing America on this week. I feel like I'm in Disney and Texas and New York all at the same time, and it's exciting. It is exciting. Now, um, I don't know if I, I know I'm not a spokesperson for Louisiana or even a spokesperson for the world, but I am going to take a moment and appoint myself to that. Um, There are struggles and challenges in living in South Louisiana. I consider the United States to be made up of 49 and a half states and then South Louisiana. And here we have our own struggles, our own problems. See, all of America, we celebrate Thanksgiving and it's a good time and we eat a lot. And then shortly after that, we celebrate Christmas and it's a good time and we eat a lot. And then you get to New Year's And the rest of America does this, oh, it's a new year, it's a new me, I'm going to clean up the diet, start getting right. But in South Louisiana, that's when Mardi Gras starts. And that means king cakes everywhere. And so now we have to postpone our diet for another holiday season. And it is struggle after struggle. And if you're not from around Louisiana, you may not understand there are king cakes everywhere. Like if you go to a gas station... There are king cakes in the gas station. And there's all different kinds. You have your traditional king cake. Then they can be a field. It can be filled with blueberry cream cheese. It can be filled with lemon. It can be filled with chocolate. Then you go to some places and they'll have a a Danish pastry king cake. In New Orleans, they have a Vietnamese king cake. Here, we will even take a king cake and fry it like a donut. And you have a deep fried king cake. We have king cake that is stuffed with Buddha and covered with steam syrup. We have everything. And I will say that I have tried every single king cake that I've listed, and I love every single one of them. The struggle is real. And then to add on top of that, it is a tradition or a custom here at Point Church that at the beginning of the year and in August, we go through 21 days of prayer. And uh, my family decided that we would step it up and also do a little fasting. And we thought for 21 days, we'd give up sweets. And that was a rookie mistake. See, had we thought it out, because we could do this again in August, we would have fasted sweets in August, but we didn't. We fasted sweets in the heart of king cake season, and it put a lot of pressure on me and stress, because I could see that everyone was 21 days ahead of me on eating king cakes, and I felt like I had to catch up. I had to make up ground. So Pastor Jared, I think you would appreciate this, that we instilled the seven pillars into our king cake eating with excellence, we begin to pursue king cakes, okay? With knowledge, we begin to find out who had the freshest and where could we get them. With discipline, we ate king cakes even when we were full. That is how we do ministry at my house. And so it has been, it has been a hard year already, but God is gonna see us through it. Now, um, I should probably read a scripture so that we know why we're here. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 22, 31 through 32. And I'm only reading two verses. So it's difficult to really get what's going on. It's difficult to get the scene or the setting that's happening in these two verses. And I could read more verses or I could spend 10 minutes and tell you what's going on. And I prefer to do that. So Luke 22, what we're going to see as we read our text is the scene that's unfolding is, is most commonly known as the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. Jesus is just hours away from being wrongfully arrested. So we are getting close to the Easter, Easter story in our scripture reading. This is the last meeting that Jesus will have with all 12 disciples before his crucifixion. Now, Jesus knows that, but the disciples are completely unaware 
of what's going on in this one night. And Jesus is giving them some last minute advice, some last minute teaching. He's putting the final touches on molding these future world shakers. This is where we get the communion, the first time that Jesus breaks bread and shares the wine. That is happening in this meal. And if you wanted to get a glimpse of what that must have been like on Jesus' mind, if you could imagine that you are maybe in a different time or a different country or both, and you're eating a meal with your family, and you know that before this meal ends, that some police force or military is going to barge through the door and drag you out. And so this is your last time to have the meal with your family. And so you're giving them advice that you think that they should know. You're giving them words of comfort. You're giving them all this. Jesus is trying to instill this into them. But the disciples do not know this. And so in the middle of this meal, in the middle of this heavy atmosphere, the disciples begin to have an argument amongst themselves about who is the greatest, who's the most liked, who's the best. And so then Jesus has to pause what he's doing and settle this dispute that's broken out. He starts teaching them about serving and humility. And in the middle of that, Jesus just, it seems that he abruptly stops and directs his attention to Simon. And that's where we pick up in Luke 22, 31 through 32. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. If you would join me as we pray over this message. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your presence. I thank you for your word that comforts us and teaches us. I ask that you bless this service and minister to us in whatever space, time, or area, or season in our life that we are watching this. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk to you guys on the next few moments on this topic, king cakes and golf balls. King cakes and golf balls. And if you're a real traditionalist, you may be seated. Now, as we read in our scripture that Jesus quickly transitions from teaching all 12 about the importance of serving, he's teaching all 12 about the importance of humility, and he focuses and directs his attention to Simon one-on-one. Simon, Simon, he says. And scholars believe that the use, that by using his name twice, they call that a two-fold utterance, it signifies an emphasis on sadness. This isn't going to be a happy talk. Then Jesus goes from directing his attention to Simon to master, masterfully switching to addressing all 12. He says, Satan is asked to sift all of you as wheat. While this message is directed towards Simon, it is a warning to all 12. There is a collective sifting that is going to come against the entire group. Now, If we're talking about the whole group, I do want to take a moment here and discuss that with you. I want to take just a second and talk to you about the disciples. Now, whenever I read a book, a movie plays in my head, okay? If I'm reading a book, a movie begins to happen about maybe uh, what the characters are wearing, what, what do they look like, what kind of accent they may have. And if I'm not careful, sometimes the movie playing in my head becomes better than the story I'm reading. So then I don't even know what I'm reading. I have this whole backstory going on about maybe these characters, they, they, uh, they knew each other five years ago and they had this brief meeting. And so I have to be very careful, but it's always going on where I imagine things. And as a kid, and then later as a teenager, and then later as a young adult, and I will be very honest, until somewhat recently, the image that I had in my mind of what the disciples looked like was completely wrong. And I hope, as I say this, that I'm not the only one who had the wrong impression. See, we know for sure that Andrew, Simon Peter, James, and John, they were professional fishermen. So if you think of what it meant to be a professional fisherman 2,000 years ago, that had to be some brave men, right? So they had limited GPS, or I guess they really had no I guess they had, no, now they, said, they had no GPS. So they're out on these boats with no GPS. They have no communication device to talk to other vessels. There is no night vision. There is no lights that illuminate in the dark. They have no weather forecasting. These are brave, hardened, tough men. So in my mind, I think of them as, as crusty, salty men. They've got gray hair and they have 
gray beards and their skin is tanned and weathered from being out in the, um, in the elements. They have crooked noses from being in fights at the local tavern. They have large hands from having their, their fingers broken and their knuckles broken from carrying in large drags of fish. I see them in my mind as being maybe the same age of Jesus, but, but maybe they look older because they've been ridden hard and put up wet. That's how I see it. But to my surprise, recently I was going over the history of the disciples and I come to find out that they were likely in their mid to late teenage years when they began to follow Jesus. We read that Simon Peter was probably the oldest because he's the only one that's mentioned being married. He had a mother-in-law. So scholars believe that he could have been 18 years of age when he began to follow Jesus. And the rest of the disciples were younger than that. If the disciples were a member of this great church, they would attend our youth nights that we call Pulse Night. If they were a member of this church, they would sit in this corner where so many of our students sit. These were teenagers. Older people might say that these were kids. Now, as the student pastor of this wonderful church, I've made a remarkable observation, and I think I'm, I'm blessed with this unique circumstance I have to make the following statement. See, I'm in this transitional age. I'm not a young person anymore, and that was hard for me to grasp, but I've come to terms with it because I now have a son who's in our point student group. I now have a kid in the youth group, so I know that if I have a kid in the youth group, I cannot be that young anymore, and that hurts. But I also do not believe that I'm an older person. I do not believe that I'm an elder. I look at the wisdom of my parents, I look at the wisdom of my in-laws and others around me, and I realize I still don't know anything. So I'm just in this place where I, I neither dream dreams nor have visions. I just exist in the church. I'm like a man without a country, a man without a generation. But I feel as though I stand on some sort of metaphorical bridge. I'm leaving one group of people, I'm leaving the young people, I probably left them a long time ago if you ask them, and I'm headed towards the older, more mature group. And I would like to address both sides without burning the bridge that I'm standing on. I would like to talk to our students. I would say that students, if I could tell you one thing, it is do not buy into the lie of the devil or the expectations of society that tell you that you are too young to be a world changer, that you are too young to start a revival, that you are too young to pray for the miraculous, that you are too inexperienced to change your surroundings. See, most of the disciples were likely 14, 15, and 16 years of age when they gave up all that they had, their future plans to follow Jesus. They were your age when they saw the dead raised, blinded eyes open, and demons cast out. They were your age when they saw the winds and the waves stop and obey God. When they saw the food multiplied to feed 5,000 plus, they were your age. They were 14, 15, and 16 when Jesus took them and sent them out without him. And they went out and they drove out many demons, anointed the sick with oil, and healed them. I will tell you, young people, that you can pray for miracles and they will happen. You can plant a seed of revival and change a friend, change a family, change a school, change a town. You can do it, young people. The disciples... They were your age when Peter stood up and preached on the day of Pentecost. They were your age when they baptized 3,000 in the name of Jesus Christ. You are not too young and you are not too inexperienced. You are the exact age that God wants you for what he has in store for you. So I will tell you, go out boldly proclaiming the word of God. Go out boldly believing of what he can do and I will tell you, he will do miraculous things through you. Now, to address the other side of the bridge, the more the elders, the more mature section, and I do this, I'll say it, but I hope you, it comes across from a complete posture of respect and humility. But the reason that these disciples, the reason that these 14, 15, and 16-year-olds, now you might call 14, 15, 16-year-old kids, but that would make them mad, but the reason that these teenagers were able to accomplish these amazing things was because they had a mentor. 
They had a teacher. They had a Jesus. They had a voice of reason and a man of patience. They had someone who had their back at all times. The disciples were teenagers, and as we read the Gospels, they acted like it. They bickered amongst themselves. They bickered against other people. Peter took a sword and cut somebody's ear off. Whenever it was a serious moment, Peter would just blurt out random things that didn't even make sense. One time when Jesus feeds the 5,000 plus, they have 12 baskets left over, which is, you know, you would think there's a basket for each child to carry. They leave them all. Not one disciple remembered to grab their basket on the journey. They were teenagers and they acted like it. But... Jesus never gave up on them. He rebuked them when they needed it, but he loved them constantly, and he led by example. And I believe wholeheartedly that our students will do amazing things. I believe that revival will happen through their works and through their faith, but they will need love, guidance, and understanding from our older saints. Will they make mistakes? Absolutely. They're teenagers. Will they, will they make you mad? More than likely. They are teenagers. But I ask of you and I pray of you, don't get frustrated with them. Don't say that is a wasted person or a wasted generation. And I know that you love them, but I just ask that you pray for them. I ask that you pray with them and I ask that you pray over them and watch what God does through them. And I do want to thank so many of you who do pray with our young people and pray for them. I appreciate that. Now, I went on quite a tangent. I realized that, and I apologize. So I'm going to reread my text because many of us probably forgot. I almost forgot why I was here. I was like, well, I guess that's it. I don't really know why I'm standing up in this room. But Luke 22, 31 through 32. We'll read it again to refresh our memory. Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, there are two parts of this verse that just, they stick out to me and they're unavoidable. But I have prayed for you. I cannot put into words the comfort that I get, the warm feeling I get when I read in red the words of Jesus. But I have prayed for you. The creator of heaven and earth, the king of kings, the God of eight billion people prays for you by name. You are on his mind. Jesus is not just wishing that you do well. He is praying for your success. Now, while that one line puts me on cloud nine, the next segment sobers me up real quick. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail you. I wish his prayer would be, but I've prayed that Satan would just disappear. Jesus doesn't pray that we won't be sifted. The prayer is not that we will avoid all hurt. The prayer is not that we will have an easy life, live in the dream, everything's fine. The prayer is that when we are tested, that our faith will not fail. So this tells me that I will be sifted. I will be tested. I will be put through the ringer. So if being sifted is unavoidable, if it is meant to happen, what, what does it mean to be sifted? Because as I was going through this, I got to thinking, again, I'm being completely honest, it's been a long time since I harvested a wheat crop. In fact, I was trying to remember the last, and I couldn't think of the last time that I harvested wheat. So I went to, as Pastor Jared mentioned, YouTube for my knowledge, and I went to see how wheat was harvested back then. So once the wheat was ready to be harvested, reapers would go out into the field and they'd begin to cut the wheat with sickles made of flint or iron and just cut it and lay it down. Then the wheat would be gathered into bundles and tied together into piles called sheaves. So sheaves for Christ, ring a bell for the OGs out there before move the mission. SFC, that's what I grew up on. I'm in the bridge. I'm in the bridge. Uh... And then the, the sheaves of wheat were brought to the threshing floor. So from here on out, everything I discuss from this moment on is, falls under the umbrella of sifting. The wheat was then laid on the threshing floor. And it wasn't gently taken care of. No, at this point, the wheat was either beaten with clubs and whips as it did something wrong. <laughs> and it was like, they're punishing the wheat it was either beaten with clubs or whips, or it was walked over by oxen dragging a weighted sled inlaid with rocks and metal, or it was rolled over with a large stone inlaid with metal. But the point of the process was to break the stalks up, to separate the grain from the wheat, to separate the chaff from what was valuable. Then, 
the chopped up wheat was taken and it was thrown in the air. This process was known as winnowing. It was thrown in the air and the wind would blow and the chaff and the stalk, the useless pieces, would be taken away, but the grain weighed much heavier and would fall back to earth. Now, <clears throat> I took the liberty when I was home, and I'm glad I'm here because uh, there's wheat from one end of my house to the other after this experiment today. But I took the process of sifting my own wheat today. So we have the grain, and, you, and this is what the threshing floor would look like. And they would winnow it, and, and all the chaff disappears. And what is left is the grain, the seed, the valuable part. All of that process that we talk about was to get rid of the useless and to save the seed. This whole process that we've demonstrated, this is sifting. So back to our verse, Simon, Simon. And you, we can make it more personal. You could say Duran, Duran. You could add your own name in there, Antonio, Antonio. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And I am not going to stop it. It's going to happen. It's meant to happen. Now, I grew up, uh, I'm 30 I'm 37, 38, I really can't, I'm one of those, I know for sure. So I do know that I was in junior high in the 90s and we had Channel One News. And I don't know if anybody, all right. And I don't know if anybody remembers this commercial, but Rachel Cook would get there with the raw egg and say, this is your brain. And she would place it down, it's coming back. And then she would take a skillet and say, this is your brain on drugs, and work. And then, and then the and then she's like, and this is what happens to your family on drugs and just hit all the dishes and your friends and she tore up the kitchen. And so I never did drugs. <laughs> I don't think I was at risk for it, but seeing that girl tear up a kitchen with a skillet, I said, you know what? Probably not worth it. Probably not worth it. But sifting will happen. So I will say that th this wheat, the sifting of wheat, this wheat is you. You could say that this wheat is your plans. This wheat is your peace. The wheat is your finances. The wheat is your health. But there's a sifting that is coming. And the sifting is meant to break it all up. And so you can see that as our, our health gets sifted, our finances, our mind, our thoughts, it is a mess. It is painful. There is a crushing that is coming. There's unpleasant times that are coming. But since the plan isn't for God to stop it, it tells me that it must be necessary. There must be a benefit to the sifting. It must be for my good if my God will allow it. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, whenever you are sifted, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and you can remember that word, perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I will tell you this, that God sees more in your situation and in your life than you will ever be able to see. God sees more potential inside of you than you will ever recognize. And the first encouraging thing to note is that God allows the sifting because he sees the grain, he sees the value while it's still on the stalk. God allows the sifting because he knows that you are not all chaff, that there is value inside of you. God sees that you are capable of producing great things, but you are likely attached to some stuff that we, he will have to sift out. Maybe it's a mindset, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a boyfriend, maybe it's a girlfriend, maybe it's comfort, but there is something that God says you have tremendous potential. I see it in you are a future world changer, but there are some things that you're going to have to let go of and you don't want to let go of it. So I'm going to have to sift you. I'm going to have to put you through this process. So the sifting process that God does, it comes from a place of love. Sifting produces purpose. It produces purpose. I love delicious things. I love sweets. That is definitely my kryptonite. I love king cake. We spent the first 15 minutes of this message talking about different kinds of king cake. And I'm not a baker, but I do love to eat. And I'm smart enough to know this. It, this, is, this is wheat, 100% wheat. I know that I cannot take this wheat and put it in a bowl with some eggs and some milk and some butter and sugar, and that would turn into this king cake. 
That's not going to happen. If I want this, this sweet's going to have to go through a process. It's going to have to change how it looks. This sweet's going to have to be sifted. It'll have to be crushed. It'll have to be threshed. It'll have to be broken apart. Then the unnecessary part will have to be blown away. And the grain needs to be removed from the stalk and then separated. And that is where you find your purpose. I believe that God is using a process right now to separate many people from what is holding them back from reaching their potential. Once separated from the stalk, you have a choice. And this is, you have a choice as to what trait you will identify with. See, once the chaff is separated from the grain, you decide what you would rather be. It's tempting to want to go back and be the chaff because it's, it's what's familiar. It was the outer coating. It's what everybody saw. It was familiar. It's a light load to carry. It just gets blown away. It has no potential, so there's no pressure and no expectation, expectation on it. There is a temptation to want to, when you're sifted, to say, no, 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 I want these traits back. I want these traits. And I believe that's why Jesus said, but I have prayed for you, because he knew there'd be an internal struggle, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. There is a temptation to not turn back, a temptation to be blown away. See, the grain, the grain is heavy. It's a heavier load to carry. It's not easily moved. It has potential, which means it has expectation. There's pressure on it. It's tempting to want to follow the desires of the chaff and to fall back on old habits, old comforts of this life, and to be left alone. But there is no future for the chaff, and there is no purpose in it. John the Baptist made it very clear in Matthew 3 when he said that the wheat will be gathered in the barn, but the chaff will be burned with unquenchable fire. Sifting reveals your purpose. Sifting will reveal your purpose. In the 1400s, the people of Scotland, also known as the Scottish, also known as the Scots, also known as the lineage of Sean Connery, they did something unthinkable. And I can't imagine what led them to do this in the 1400s. My only assumption is that at this time, they were at complete peace with everything and everyone around them. That they had mastery of skill, they had an abundance of happiness, and that um, there was no addictions in the land. So what they decided to do in the 1400s was the Scottish invented the game of golf. And since the 1400s, people have been frustrated, Addicted, lost their pride, lost their dignity, lost friendships over this very fun hobby of golf. Today, more than 900 million rounds of golf are played every year on 25,000 courses by more than 50 million golfers. So golf has gone mainstream. And golf has changed a lot. It's had 600 years to evolve. But one of the things that has changed the most is the golf ball. See, the first golf balls were made completely out of wood from a hardwood tree. And it was apparently very painful to play. You had a wooden club whacking a wooden ball and it would send vibrations and shock up the arm and hands. In the 1600s, they developed the feathery golf ball. It was done by taking a leather pouch and filling it full of goose feathers. It was said that it would take an entire bucket of goose feathers to make one ball. And a skilled craftsman could only make about four balls in a day. I lose four golf balls on my first tee. That's a true story. In the 1800s, it continued to improve, and the gutty balls were made. And these were made from dried tree sap, and they had a rubbery feel. And the gutty balls changed the way the game was played. But the quest still continued for a better golf ball, one that flew further, and one that flew straighter, and one that flew truer. So in the early 1900s, there was a gentleman who was studying the flight of golf balls. And he made an observation. He had a, a hypothesis. And he was so embarrassed by what he, was, what he wanted to test out that he went to work early that day to perform his experiment before any coworkers were there. It was his observation that the old gutty golf balls, the ones that had been beaten and bruised and banged around, it was his observation that those flew straighter and further than the brand new smooth and rounded one. So he went into his workshop and began to purposely cut divots and our dimples into these balls. And his hypothesis was true that the little marks, the imperfections, allowed the golf balls to travel up to twice as far as the smoother golf balls. 
And today a modern golf ball has 300 to 500 imperfections on purpose known as dimples. So I will tell you what I've learned from this, and that is that the scars from the sifting process do not limit you, but they propel you. The markups, the bangs, the bruises that you experience, they don't limit you. They are actually necessary to let you fly further and straighter than you could before you were sifted. The disciples did great and miraculous acts while Jesus walked with them. But their ministry and their story did not end with the death of Jesus Christ. With the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, they were scattered, they were scarred, and they were sifted. They went into hiding. We read of them staying behind locked doors for fear of their life. Uncertainty struck the disciples. Fear gripped them. They were being sifted. I could see them hiding in a room saying, this isn't how I thought it'd be. Our Savior, the one who's going to rescue us and our people, we've seen him dead. It's been three days and there's no sign of him. I should have stayed a fisherman. I should have stayed a tax collector. I should have stayed at home. They were being sifted. But after the death and after the burial and after the resurrection of Jesus, we see before his ascension, Jesus is meeting with his disciples again. And Jesus has a conversation with Simon Peter, the one he gave the warning to. In John 21, Jesus asked Simon three times, do you love me? And each time he would ask Simon Peter, Simon would say, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus would ask him again, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And each time Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Take care of the lambs. Make way for the new church. Strengthen your brothers. See, just 10 days after that, we see that Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 are being baptized, and the church continued to grow daily. The sifting that God is putting you through is not to destroy you. In this process, you will gain purpose and you will gain your destiny. In this process, your ministry will be refined and your calling will become more clear and you will accomplish more than you could ever expect or think. I believe that the lumps and the bumps that you receive will be your testimony to share with your neighbors and your coworkers and your family. Romans chapter five, three through four says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that our sufferings produce perseverance. There that word is again. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. I'm telling you that on the other side of your sifting is the hope that you need. Peace that doesn't make any sense for your life is on the other side of being sifted. Your breakthrough is on the other side of the sifting process. The change in your life, the change in your family, the change in your community, it's on the other side of sifting. So my prayer for you today is that your faith does not fail you in this season, but rather you turn to God and strengthen those around you. I wanna say a prayer for you, wherever you are, whatever space you are in. If you're going through a sifting process, I pray that God will strengthen you and that you will remain with him and identify with the grain. If you're not going through this process, I don't wanna sound like a Debbie Downer, but it's sure to come. I pray that you remember this message and you stay close to God. Lord, I thank you that you see the potential in each and every one of us. And I thank you, God, that you love us so much that you won't just let us stay where we are, but you see what's inside of us. So through an act of love, you put us through a sifting process. Lord, I pray over every saint that you strengthen them wherever they are, that their faith may not fail you, and that when they come to the other side, God, that you anoint them specifically for the calling that you have, for their family, for their work their community. I ask that you be with each one in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God.
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.